CRN is stand for cervical intraepithelium neoplasm. It is a precancerous condition of the cervix. Appropriate treatment of biopsy proven CRN is one of the most important component in organized cervical cancer prevention program. This video clip will show you how to treat CRN and how do you manage them after treatment. You will also watch how lip or loop electrosurgical excision procedures is being performed step by step. All these video clips is for the guide to all gynecologists or corposcopists who are directly involved in the management of pre-invasive disease of lower genital tract. When we talk about treatment of CRN, it is very important to remember that the diagnosis must be made by biopsy. Treatment based on cytology result is definitely inappropriate and should not be practiced by any gynecologist. Please request for urgent histology report if you suspect high-grade lesion or invasive disease. Mastering coposcoping examination is very important so that the diagnosis of CRN is accurate and at the same time, we do not miss the more advanced lesion that may coexist with low-grade lesion. Coposcoping skill is also important to assist the coposcopist during treatment such as lip because without adequate visualization of the transformation zone and the entire lesion, treatment may not be complete and the risk of residual or recurrence disease will be higher. Understanding the physiology and anatomy of cervix, especially transformation zone, is mandatory. More than 95% of CRN and invasive cancer of cervix are arising from transformation zone. Transformation zone is an area between old or original squamocolumnar junction and new squamocolumnar junction. In this slide, old or original squamocolumnar junction is representing by blue line, while new squamocolumnar junction is shown by green line. Therefore, the area between blue line and green line is called transformation zone. What is CRN? As I mentioned earlier, treatment for CRN must be based on histology. The right image shown in this slide is corposcopic view of CRN1 showing thin or grade 1 acetylwhite epithelium with satellite lesion suggestive of human papilloma virus infection. While image on the left is microscopic view of CRN1 showing these plastic cells occupying inner one third of the epitheliums. There is also evidence of HPV infection with the presence of coilocyte. Coilocyte is the epithelial cell that has the following characteristic enlarged cell, perinuclear halo, hyperchromasia, and occasionally binucleation. Coilocyte is an indirect evidence of replicative phase of HPV infection. This is CRN2. Acetylwhite epithelium looks denser grade 2 and if under larger magnification we may be able to see the presence of atypical vessels. Image on the left is showing microscopic view of CRN2. This plastic cells layer has extending up involving two thirds of the epitheliums. There is also evidence of HPV infection by the presence of coilocytes. This is CRN3. Coposcopic view of CRN3 are shown in image A and B. In A, wash the dense acetylwhite epitheliums with clear and raised margin involving upper part of the transformation zone. Watch also the presence of abnormal vessel. Image B is showing mosaic and punctation overlying the dense acetylwhite background. In this particular cases, all must always remember that biopsy must be done and the site of biopsy must be directed to the most suspicious area in order to rule out coexisting microinvasion or even invasive disease. This is a close-up view of cervix with wide range of abnormalities. Green dashes line delineate the new squamocolumnar junction, whereas blue line represent old squamocolumnar junction. Transformation zone is the area between old or blue line and new squamocolumnar junction or green line. Watch the grade 3 mosaic over the lower half of the cervix with coarse punctation. The degree of mosaic and punctation is assessed based on what we call 
intercapillary distance. The larger the distance, the higher the grade of lesion. Widening of intercapillary distance is due to expanding neoplastic lesion in the underlying epithelium. There is also dense acetoid epithelium at 3 o'clock position. This acetoid is grade 3 acetoid because of its intense whitening with raised and regular margin. All these features are point towards high grade lesion and even micro invasion. This slide is showing invasive carcinoma of the cervix. Image A is microscopic view of micro invasion. Watch the clumps of cancer cells which has breaching the basement membrane. The invasion is less than 3 mm. That is why it is called micro invasion. Image on the bottom and right, which is B, is frank invasive cancer. Wide area of cervical stroma has been infiltrated by cancer cells. This patient has to be treated either by surgery or radiotherapy. What will happen if you do not treat the CRN? Ostor E.G. have shown in his study that majority of CRN1, especially in young women, will regress spontaneously without treatment in approximately 57% of cases. However, in CRN2, 22% will progress with 5% risk of progression to invasive cancer. In more than 12% of CRN3 will progress to invasive cervical cancer. Based on this study, clearly that CRN2 and CRN3 must be treated if we want to prevent invasive cervical cancer. Our next video clip will show you how to manage CRN. As I mentioned earlier, CRN is based on histology, not based on cytology. CRN1 can be managed either by observation or by offering treatment. All immunocompromised patients must be treated. All other high-risk women such as smokers, sexual workers, multiple sexual partners have history of gynec cancer in her family. Age more than 35 and patients with positive high-risk HPV should also be treated. In selected low-risk patients, especially good compliance and younger than 35, they may suitable for conservative management. Women who are treated conservatively must be followed up closely every 6 months with corposcopy and pap smear. If CRN1 persists more than 12 months, they should also be offered surgical treatment. If we decide to treat CRN1, there are two modalities of treatment. Number one, local ablation and number two, excisional method. Majority of patients can be treated by local ablation except if the scomocolumnar junction or the lesion are not completely seen on corposcopy. Patient with extensive CRN1 and the lesion extending into the cervical canal is also not suitable for local ablation. After treatment, patient should be followed up with pap smear 6 months after the procedures. Subsequently, corposcopy and pap smear are repeated 12 months later. If corposcopy and repeat pap smear are normal, advise patient to repeat the pap smear yearly for 2 years and if both pap smear are normal, then she can return to her normal routine pap smear that is 3 yearly unless if this patient is at high risk of recurrence. If this patient is high risk patient such as immunocompromised, smokers, sexual workers and has multiple sexual partners, then she should continue yearly pap smear. All patients with CRN2 and CRN3 must be treated. How do you treat CRN2 and CRN3? Majority of women with CRN2 and CRN3 must be treated by excisional method. Only small selected patients may be considered ablative therapy. To treat this woman with local ablative therapy, at least four requirements must be fulfilled. Number one, you must be a trained corposcopist. Number two, upper limit of the lesion is fully visualized. Number three, entire transformation zone is fully seen. And last but not least, there must be no suspicious of micro invasion, invasion or glandular lesion. What are the type of local ablative therapy and excisional therapy? 
In local ablative therapy, there will be no tissue obtained for histologic diagnosis, while in excisional method, lesion together with its surrounding area will be obtained and sent for histologic examination. There are at least four types of local ablative therapy such as cryotherapy, radical diatomy, laser vaporization, and cold coagulation. In excisional method, there are four types. There is LIP or loop electrosurgical excision procedures or in UK it called LEDs, L -L -E -T -Z, stand for large loop excision of transformation zone. The other three excisional methods are knife cone, laser cone, and Colorado microdissection cone. As I have mentioned earlier, there are four types of local ablative therapy, but the most widely practiced nowadays is cryotherapy and laser vaporization. We will only discuss on these two types of local ablative therapy. Cryotherapy is the most promising local ablative treatment, especially in country with low resource setting. Cryotherapy relies on a steady supply of compressed refrigerant nitrogen dioxide gas in transportable cylinders. Cryotherapy is not adequate to treat lesion involving the endocervix. If excellent contact between the cryoprobe tip and the ectocervix is achieved, temperature of minus 89 degrees Celsius will be achieved at the core of the ice ball and minus 20 degrees Celsius at the periphery. Cells exposed to temperature of less than minus 20 degree will undergo cryonecrosis. Healing is accompanied by a watery discharge which may be lasted up to 4 to 8 weeks. The advantages of cryotherapy are inexpensive, no need for anesthesia and can be done in outpatient department. This treatment is also as effective as other local ablative treatment. The disadvantages of this method is the death of freezing and destruction of cells cannot be controlled and there is no tissue sample obtained for histology examination. What will happen to the cervix after cryotherapy? This slide is showing the changes that are taking place over the treatment site of the cervix following cryotherapy. Slide A is showing the immediate effect called ice ball formation. After two weeks, the tissue that undergoing cryonecrosis will slough off as shown in slide B. Slide C is a full recovery of cervix three months after cryotherapy and finally slide D one year after cryotherapy. Word laser is an abbreviation for light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. The carbon dioxide laser most frequently used in the treatment of CRN is produced from an electrical discharge with a wavelength of 10.6 micrometer in the infrared part of spectrum. Laser beam energy is absorbed by material with a high water content, for example cervical tissue. Entire transformation zone is vaporized to the lateral margin of 3 mm and to the depth of 7 mm. Laser vaporization required at least local anesthesia as well as adrenaline in injection. Laser vaporization has an advantage for being accurate, precise, and depth of tissue destruction can be controlled. However, laser treatment requires tight safety measures, experienced operator, and very expensive. Similar with cryotherapy, in laser vaporization, there will be no tissue obtained for histologic examination. Next section of this video clip will demonstrate all about excisional treatment for CRN. All gynecologists and corposcopies who involve directly with treatment of pre-invasive disease of cervix must be able to perform the excisional treatment such as lip and knife cone biopsy. Before I show you the video clip on lip and Colorado microdissection cone biopsy, please watch what are the requirements in terms of the instruments and preparation of patient before undergoing excisional treatment for CRN. The principle of excisional treatment for CRN is to remove the entire lesion with good margin. With good margin, recurrence rate will be minimized and the aim of prevention of cervical cancer will be achieved. Please remember that cervix has two components, that is ectocervix and endocervix. CRN can extend high into the endocervical region. 
When we treat the CRN, always remember that CRN can extend into the endocervical canal. CRN can also extend down into any of the glands or crypts in the transformation zone. For the low-grade lesion, the minimum depth of treatment is 7 mm. However, when excisional method is performed for high-grade lesion like CRN2 and CRN3 to obtain good margin, the treatment should involve to the depth of 15 mm. High-grade lesion rarely extend up to more than 15 mm. One of the most important instruments for lip is loop electrodes. There are various sizes and type of loop electrodes. Size of loop electrode is determined by its width and height of the loop. Width and height of the loop will determine the size of cone removed from the cervix. These loop electrodes will be connected to the generator. This slide is showing various type and size of electrodes, either loop electrodes or ball electrodes. There are four types of loop electrode shown in the slide. That is T-bar, T-bar square, sling and U-bar. T-bar and U-bar loop electrodes are the most commonly used electrodes. They come with various sizes. Apart from loop electrodes, there is also ball electrodes used to secure the hemostasis at the end of the lip. Ball electrodes are also come with various sizes such as 3mm, 5mm and 8mm. Our next slide will show you how to choose the loop electrodes. Size of loop electrodes is depend on the size of lesion, extent of lesion and the type of transformation zone. There are three types of transformation zone. This is type 1 transformation zone. Type 1 transformation zone is when the transformation zone is completely seen on the ectocervic. All part of transformation zone is seen even without coposcoping examination. Transformation zone can be small or large. If you have patient with this type of transformation zone and you are able to see entire lesion, the best loop electrode to choose is a single U-bar size 20 by 15 mm. Ball electrode is used to secure the hemostasis or wound sealing. This is type 2 transformation zone. Type 2 transformation zone is partially visible and partly situated in the endocervical canal. Image on the left is type 2 transformation zone where upper part of transformation zone is not seen without manipulation. In this type 2 transformation zone, we can visualize the entire transformation zone through manipulation using coposcopy, either using simple forcep, cotton bud, or special forcep called endocervical spiculum. For this type 2 transformation zone, we can use either T-bar size 20 by 15 mm or U-bar size 20 by 20 mm. Finally, type 3 transformation zone. Type 3 transformation zone can be either small or large. In type 3 transformation zone, entire transformation zone is not fully visualized even with the aid of coposcope. In some human, like in image A, the transformation zone is very large and some of it is in the endocervical canal. In some human, the entire transformation zone is within the endocervical canal as shown in B. Selected loop electrode must have either long loop such as T-bar size 20 by 20 mm or we accomplish lip through two, two passes or two sweeps using two loop electrodes such as T-bar size 20 by 15 and T-bar size 10 by 10 mm. Smaller loops is to obtain endocervical component of transformation zone. The other alternative to treat CRN with type 3 transformation zone is by knife cone biopsy. Top head technique is employed in patients with endocervical gland involvement or who has type 3 transformation zone with a lesion extending deep into the endocervical canal. Two excision or two incision or sweep are made. First sweep is using T-bar size 20 by 15 mm to obtain first specimen shaded in blue. This specimen is 10 mm depth with 3 mm free margin. While second sweep is using T-bar size 10 by 10 mm or sometimes we can use sling electrodes to obtain second sample from endocervix with 5 mm depth. Second sweep specimen is shown in yellow color. Endocervical crotage may be indicated prior to lip. 
if patient has CIN extending into the canal, pap smear shows presence of atypical glandular cells, or if the squamal columnar junction not well visualized. If endometrial pathology is also suspected, PPL endometrial sampling should also be done. Instrument used for endocervical curettage is known as Kevokian curate. These are the basic requirements for lip procedures. Lip should be done under coposcopic guidance where mapping of the lesion is made prior to the procedures. Choose a correct speculum and fit to the tubing for smoke evacuation. Choose the most appropriate size of loop based on the type of transformation zone and the extent of the lesion. Solution containing lignocaine and adrenaline 1 in 80,000 is used to inject the cervix in all quadrants to minimize pain and bleeding. The alternative to adrenaline solution is 1 in 100 dilution of vasopressin. Lip is performed using cutting current ranging from 35 to 60 watt. 50 watt is the best current in most instances. Bone coagulation using spray mode current of 50 to 60 watt is used for wound sealing and hemostatic purpose at the end of the procedures. Counseling is very important to make sure patients understand the procedures and why they have to undergo such treatment. Patients should also be explained potential complications and what she will expect to experience during and a few days after the procedures. Written consent should be obtained. I routinely give a single dose of oral antibiotics such as augmentin to be taken in the morning of the procedures. In patients with low pain thresholds, you can advise them to take an oral analgesic such as paracetamol or methamphetamine acid one to two hours prior to lips. Following is the video clip step by step loop lateral surgical excision procedures or lip. These are the six steps that you should prepare just before you approach the cervix with loop electrodes to start excising the transformation zone in lip. Number one, position the patient. Number two, attach the diatomy ground plate to the patient. Number three, choose the appropriate loop electrodes. Number four, insert the speculum and connect the speculum to the suction tubing. Number five, focus the coposcope using a low magnification such that the entire transformation zone is visible within one field of view. And number six, select the appropriate power setting. Explain to patients, insert the speculum gently and visualize the entire cervix. Make sure you are able to see the entire cervix. Visualize the entire transformation zone and apply the acetic acid solution. After applying the acetic acid, you can see there is acetoid epithelium at 1 o'clock position. This is important to guide you during lip. Visualize the cervix transformation zone and the lesion carefully. Apply the Slugos iodine to map the lesion and transformation zone. As you can see in the video clip, very clear ID negative uptake at the lesion as well as the columnar epithelium. This is important to guide you when you want to excise the transformation zone as well as the lesion. Ensure that the margin of the excision is at least 3 mm. Inject the uh, cervix quadrant by quadrant with, with lignocaine and adrenaline 1 in 80,000. Begin the injection at sub-epithelial portion of the cervix and then inject further in the stroma of the cervix. You can repeat the injections twice and in principle, I normally use 1 to 2 cc of solution in each quadrant. The alternative to adrenaline solution is 1 in 100 dilution of vasopressin. After injecting the uh, cervix, wait for 1 to 2 minutes. Use 
use the appropriate loop electrodes and start excising the transformation zone and the lesion by using this method. Ensure that you get uh, at least 3 mm margin. To secure the hemostasis, you can use a ball diatomy. I normally use the size 8 or 5 mm ball diatomy using the spray current 50 to 60 watts. Apply in all areas to stop the bleeding. This is important not only for the purpose of hemostasis but also to destroy any remaining CRN or pre-invasive lesion that left behind. I also use the Monzel solution apply over the raw area to stop the bleeding and to ensure that patient will not re-bleed after the adrenaline effect has weaned off. Some patient may have the extensive uh, lesion in the cervix like in this patient. In this video clip you can see extensive acetoid epithelium involving the anterior and posterior lips. Almost the uh, entire transformation zone is involved by the uh, lesions and after application of Lugol's iodine you can see how extensive the uh, lesion although the lesion is extensive but you are able to actually identify the uh, margin of the lesion so after application of the Lugol's iodine now you can see the injection of the adrenaline and salicylcaine use the uh, adrenaline solution 1 in 80,000 you can also use the vasopressin 1 in 100 dilution inject all quadrants initially with a sub epithelial injection basically you can use 1 to 2 cc of solution in each quadrant Okay, inject all quadrants and then uh, you wait for 1 to 2 minutes before you start uh, excising the uh, lesion. Choose the appropriate uh, loop electrodes. You can use a U or T bar. Use a U bar size 20 by 15 millimeter and excise the uh, upper part of the lesion. This is lesion at the anterior lips. This is a first sweep or first pass to remove the lesion at the anterior lip. So after rem after you excise, remove the specimen and label the specimen. This is second pass or second sweep uh, involving the lower half of the cervix uh, to remove the lesion in the posterior lips. And uh, after complete the uh, excision, you can uh, secure the hemostasis by using a ball coagulation as seen uh, in this video clip. You may have to do multiple excision if you do not remove the entire lesion with good margin. Make sure you label the specimen carefully to guide your pathologist in preparing the slide and reporting the histology report. Next video clip will show you how to perform Colorado Microdissection Cone Biopsy. Colorado Microdissection Cone Biopsy is using a Colorado needle which has a very fine tip and because of fine tip, the power setting is very low we can use 10 to 15 watts instead of 50 watts in the normal leap due to a low power setting thermal artifact in Colorado microdissection cone biopsy is very minimal and in good hand it is comparable with knife cone biopsy 
The preparation for Colorado microdissection cone biopsy is similar with lip and also with knife cone biopsy. You can perform Colorado microdissection cone biopsy as a daycare setting. In this patient, Colorado microdissection cone biopsy was performed under regional anesthesia for adenocarcinoma in situ of cervix. Immediately after the procedures, please re-explain and re-emphasize to patient regarding what she may experience few days after the procedures. She may have slight vagina staining up to one week, vagina discharge up to 7 to 10 days, and mild lower abdominal discomfort for 3 days. She must come back immediately if she is having excessive vagina bleeding, false smelling vagina discharge, and fever, and unexplained severe abdominal pain. I will provide her a few days supply of analgesics and medical leave for one week. After leave, follow-up is very important. I will see patient one week after the procedures. Reason for seeing patient one week after procedures is to review any immediate complication. If patient complain of excessive discharge, I will do the speculum examination and I will do vagina douching using chlorhexidine lotion to clean any remaining blood clots and discharge from the vagina. I will review the histology if I have decided to send specimen for urgent HPE. I will also do physical examination such as taking temperature and do abdominal examination for any tenderness. There will be no special test to be done during these visits. This image shows the cervix immediately after lip on the left and two weeks after lip on the right. Watch images on the right. Two weeks after lip, granulation tissue will rebuild the cervix and restore its normal anatomy. Patients should not have any vagina bleeding two weeks after lip. Second follow-up can take place four to six weeks after lip. Reason for follow-up is to see any long-term complication, to ask patient any specific symptoms related to the procedures, to assess the healing process, and to review the non-urgent histology report. During the second visit, I will do similar general examination as during first visit and I will do pelvic examination to assess the healing process. If histology reported, CRN with clear resection margin, no pap smear or coposcopy to be done until 6 months later. Patient will be counseled to repeat her pap smear and coposcopy in 6 months time and advised to resume her normal sexual activity. Watch complete recovery of cervix 3 months after leap on the left and one year after leap on the right. Patient can resume sexual activity as early as one month after leap. They can start trying to conceive after three to six months after leap. Subsequent visit is six monthly for 24 months. Each visit I will repeat pap smear and do endocervical sampling and coposcoping examination. After 24 months, patient will be advised to have yearly pap smear. During counseling session, Every gynecologist or coposcopist must have a knowledge not only how to perform the procedures but also the risk of complication. With this knowledge, patient will be given a correct information and have a reasonable expectation. In good hand, significant bleeding is very rare, only 1.35% in lip. Vagina discharge is common in 72% of patients with medium duration of 12 days. Patient will also experience vagina staining up to 7 days in 70% of them. Pain and discomfort may be experienced in 41% of cases up to 3 days duration. There is no complication to the future fertility and pregnancy. Cervical stenosis can occur in 1-5% to of cases.